Welcome to Keith and I Don't Tread on Anyone and the Libertarian Institute. Today, I am joined by my colleague at the One Great Work Network, Mark Passio. Mark, where is the best place to find your personal website and collection of research? My main website can be found at uh, whatonearthishappening.com. And as always, I tell people that the main body of material at that website is in the podcast section, uh, where I've done over uh, 240 podcasts to date. Uh, we're actually approaching the 250th podcast uh, this coming Sunday. So um, if you go to the podcast section of whatonearthishappening.com and you uh, listen and watch the podcasts in order without skipping around. They are cumulative information that have prerequisite knowledge uh, for the later ones in the earlier episodes. So if you just uh, watch, uh, listen and watch those without skipping around, people will get uh, the bulk of the information that I talk about and uh, a worldview tapestry will be unfurled for them that makes all the connections that they need to understand what's currently taking place in our world. So Keith, I want to say thank you for bringing me on as well. It's always a pleasure to be on Don't Tread on Anyone. So thank you for having me back. Hey, anytime. Mark, what is morality and how do you know morality is objective? So I would say that morality is um, uh, the characteristics that either define moral or immoral behavior or right and wrong action, whether an action is a right or whether it is a wrongdoing. So um, this is something that exists objectively in nature for one main simple fact. All you have to do to prove that morality is objective and exists in nature and is not a constructural idea of the mind is you are um, looking at characteristics of behavior. That is what defines what morality is. So logically and philosophically, you have to ask yourself the first question, where are, where does the behavior take place? Is the behavior a constructural idea of the mind or is the behavior an action which takes place in the physical domain so if it's a constructural idea of the mind only like uh, chocolate ice cream is delicious uh, that takes place in the mind chocolate ice cream is what it is in nature but whether it's delicious or not is a constructural idea whether a behavior initiates harm to another being or not is not a constructural idea. The behavior and the harm take place in the physical realm. So <clears throat> the uh, behavior is part of nature. As such, the characteristics of the behavior are part of nature. They're not constructural ideas of the mind. So if a behavior initiates harm, that's happening physically in the realm of nature and not constructurally. It's not a subjective thing as to whether it initiates harm or not. Now, if you want to get into, you know, semantical arguments about like harm through words and things like that and harming feelings, that's not what we're really talking about when we talk about morality. Morality means you are actively doing something that is within your rights, meaning it doesn't initiate harm to others, or you are actively doing something that is outside of your natural rights because it does initiate harm to others. And then we have to define the objective standards for what are the harmful behaviors? Because all of morality and moral action, moral behavior is defined in the negative. And this is something that I've been over pretty extensively in my work, but it's really important to reiterate and to understand it deeply, logically and philosophically, is that um, there is only a very small amount of behaviors that we do not have the right to perform. We have pretty much unlimited infinite number of rights because rights again are actions that we can perform that do not initiate harm against our fellow sentient beings but there's only a very small list of actions that um, uh, incorporate the characteristics that initiate harm to other beings and they are murder assault rape theft trespass coercion and deception these are what i call the seven deadly sins the true seven deadly sins, as opposed to the seven deadly sins of Christianity and, uh, and you know, if, if you want to just say the religious world, uh, that are all 
basically vices instead of actual crimes, actual harm that is performed that is initiated towards someone else. Um, you know, if you look at the subjective uh, quote unquote sins of religion, uh, you know, you have, um, uh, let's see, it's uh, anger, uh, pride, gluttony, sloth, lust, anger, jealousy, greed. Now, if you break each one of those down in turn, those are all vices which are done to the self, essentially. They're, they're, they're not extended toward other beings. You know, pride is something that, you know, if it's counterproductive, that's going to be not good for oneself. Gluttony, you eat too much, you, you, that you've done that to yourself. So these are all vices that uh, are not really smart things to do for oneself, but they are not crimes in the sense that they are not actions that we perform upon others that we have no right to perform. The real list of actions that if we do to others, we have violated natural law, we have violated the objective rules of morality are murder, which is the taking of life, stealing of life without your, your right to do so, assault, the taking of bodily well-being or bodily autonomy without the right to, to do so, um, rape, the taking of uh, free will sexual association uh, from another, which is also taking their free will. And it's uh, physical violence to, to boot, um, uh, tresp uh, theft, which is the taking of physical property and or you know uh, financial uh, assets, etc. Um, trespass, which is taking someone's security in their living space, their living domain. Um, <clears throat> uh, coercion, that's the 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 theft of one's free will. You are placing someone. Uh, under duress or the threat of violence by coercing them. And uh, the final one is deception, uh, which is, uh, you know, a little bit less in the physical domain. But if you um, willfully tell people uh, something that you know is inaccurate and wrong, and you try to influence their decision-making ability to make an informed decision through willful deception, uh, that is also taking and stealing. So uh, you are taking away uh, their uh, basic right to make an informed decision based on what is actual and real and true. Now, obviously, if people just simply, you know, uh, speculate and don't know the answer, that's not deception. But I'm talking about willfully knowing that you're giving someone inaccurate information. And uh, that would be, you know, down probably at the bottom of the totem pole of all of these, uh, you know, um, harmful actions. So um, every one of them is a form of theft. So we could really say that morality boils down to definitively knowing what is your property and what is not your property. If you want to look at all of the harmful behaviors as forms of theft, and they are all taken in turn, they are all a form of theft in one way or another, then morality would be uh, knowing the behaviors that are forms of theft and therefore harmful uh, against other sentient beings and willfully understanding that those behaviors are morally are t completely illegitimate to engage in. And if we want to consider ourselves a good person, we should desist in uh, either engaging in those behaviors or even condoning those behaviors. So that is how I would look at objective morality. And the fact that it is objective simply comes from the fact that the behaviors that we are analyzing and that, that are in question regarding whether they cause harm or not take place in the physical realm of the natural world and are not simply constructural ideas of the mind. Therefore, their characteristics also exist in the realm of nature and therefore they are objective. So what I want to do is go over two uh, stories here. I just want to make sure my screen is getting shared. Okay, so we, we can see this. I'm going to give you two stories mm -hmm. that I have come across that kind of make my blood boil <laughs> a little. I want you to walk us through your thought process. I'm going to give you the two and then give you the floor. Okay. Give us your thought process as opposed to what the mainstream thought process would be, maybe uh, this is the law. If you don't like it, you can change it. Walk me through how you come across something like this. So the first story we have, this L.A. musician built $1,200 tiny houses for the homeless. He crowdfunded 
$100,000 to build dozens of tiny homes. City officials looking to pass a $2 billion housing plan tried to shut him down, and sadly, they succeeded. In February, the city council responded to Elvis Summers by amending a sweeps ordinance to allow the tiny houses to be seized without prior notice, even though they were on private property. On the morning of the 9th, just as the mayor and council gathered at City Hall to announce their new plan to end homelessness, police and garbage trucks descended on the tiny homes, towing three of them to the Bureau of Sanitation lot for disposal. Summers managed to move eight of the threatened houses into storage before they were <clears throat> confiscated, but the residents were left back on the sidewalk. Next story, very similar. This one's happening in Washington, D.C., as opposed to Los Angeles. Jay Austin's beautiful, illegal, tiny houses. He had the same crowdfunding method. He was building the houses for about ten to $50,000. And the small caveat, but the tiny houses come with one enormous catch. They're illegal, in violation of several codes in Washington, D.C.'s zoning ordinance among the many requirements in the 34 chapters and 600 pages of codes are mandates defining minimum lot size, room size, alleyway widths, and accessory dwelling units that prevent tiny houses from being anything more than a part-time residence. So when it comes to this, someone might say, well, look, that's the law. We, we need laws to live. And you should have known that, so you shouldn't have built them. And also, thank God we have these regu regulations, or else there would be chaos. How do you look at those stories, and how do you analyze them? I would simply ask any person of the limited intellect that would make the statement that, uh, you know, we, we have to have government shut projects like that down, uh, shut private operations like that down. Um, I would ask them, do you have the right to go and steal those homes and destroy them? You yourself as an individual. So Keith, do you have the right? If someone in your town goes and makes some tiny homes and distributes it out to the homeless to say, I'll be over there later. I'm going to take the home. I'm going to smash it to bits and get rid of it. And if you try to stop me, I'm going to hurt you. Would you have the right to do that? If someone in your city created a tiny home, me, no, but uh, our elected officials uh, that we've chosen to represent us, well, they do. Right. So does any individual have the right to go over there on their own and stop people from doing such behavior? I wouldn't say any. I, I think you'd have to have legitimate authority, the police officer, sheriff, someone, someone in that arena. But I, I mean as an individual. So in other words, the individual, let's say Bob Brown, uh, you know, who, who, whose job is a police officer, um, on his time, on his own time, wants to go over there because he just doesn't like the project that's being done with the homeless. And he's going to call up the person who made the home or who is active in actively in possession of the home and say, I'll see you at four o'clock today. I'm coming over and taking that house. If you try to stop me, there will be violence. On his own, Bob on his own, no. That that seems very vigilante and sort of chaotic. So, no. so does anyone as an individual have the right to steal property that was created and given to other individuals? Does any individual on the planet as an individual on their own have that right? Acting outside of the sphere of legitimacy of the state, <laughs> no. So then, if... All together, a group of 100 people do not have $100,000 to build a, a, a lot of tiny homes like that, uh, an amount of tiny homes to distribute. Uh, and on their own, none of them have that. Would they have the resources all pulled together to be able to get that job done? If 100 people have zero, a zero, zero times 100 would still be zero. I think anything times zero we can agree on is still zero. So they do not have the right to act in that capacity as an individual. So if no one has $100,000 and altogether no one has $100,000, how could they all come together and agree that they're going to create something that costs $100,000 or give something give $100,000 to someone else or something worth $100,000 to someone else. They don't have it. Therefore, they cannot give it. So in 
like fashion, how could all individuals coming together, no matter how many there are, you could say there's 100,000 people coming together, zero of them have the natural right to engage in a particular type of violent behavior because it is violating someone else's rights because they are acting within their rights. They have not caused, they have not initiated harm to other sentient beings in the performance of that act. That act is simply building the home, giving the home to someone. There is no violence inherent in the act. There is no violence in the natural world through that behavior. That is a right. Therefore, stopping that is not a right because stopping that breaks one of the breaks one of the violators. It, it initiates one of the violators or the transgressions against natural law, which is coercion. OK, you are violating someone's free will. You are placing them in duress by saying we're saying that you cannot do this, even though it is one of your rights. And then they're coming with physical violence in the form of theft. And then if that were resisted, they would come with more physical violence in the form of assault. And then if that were resisted, they would come in more physical violence in the form of murder. That is all agents of the state, agents of authority ever do. That is all they ever have done in all of human history is come with escalating forms of violence. And that is all they ever will do for as long as the insane cult that we refer to as government continues in the foreseeable future. If a hundred people don't have, or a hundred thousand people or a hundred million people do not possess as individuals a right in the natural world to enact upon their fellow human being, because that action initiates harm, then no one or any amount of said individuals can come together and agree upon their ability to grant or delegate that action to another being or another group of beings. Because as we've already agreed, multiplying by zero still is zero. If there isn't the right to perform the behavior on the part of an individual, then no amount of magic, no amount of wishing for it to be so, magical thinking, or crazy rituals that are performed by government agencies and government buildings that look like temples, because that's all it really is, is a cult. It's a religious cult if we really break it down with its own symbols, with its own rituals, etc. No amount of people coming together to perform said rituals or wishing for it to be so through magical thinking can ever make it more legitimate in objective reality and nature for the other individuals to perform those behaviors. In other words, the delegation of a wrong can never be performed. No one, j just like it, you pick an action that is one of those wrongdoings, okay? So coercing your peaceful neighbor when they've not harmed another and you're going to coerce them and say, you know what? Every Wednesday night, that's my trash night. That's I have to put my trash out every Wednesday night out on the sidewalk. You're going to come over to my house and you're going to put my trash out. I'm telling you, you're going to do that. And if you miss a night, I'm coming to your house with a tire iron, iron and I'm going to smack your kneecaps with a tire iron. That is absolute duress and coercion. You are threatening somebody. You're making threats of violence against another being if they don't conform their will to what you want them to do. So I'm enforcing my will violently upon another. That's the definition of coercion and duress. So let's say I did that. Okay. Would I be within my rights to do that? Of course not. So could anyone in the world, no matter what institution was invented, if we had the, the, we created, all people came together, we created the institution of the society that must put out Mark's trash on Wednesday night. Okay. We all agreed we're creating this institution and we are going to imbue upon Mark the ability to go to one of his neighbor's homes. And at the beginning of the week, I can say, be here on Wednesday or on Thursday morning, your kneecaps are getting smashed. You know, can any amount of people 
delegate or grant a wrongdoing to any other individual or group of individuals, no matter how many you multiply the zero by that does not have that right. Of course, the answer is in the natural world, in the realm of reality, nature, and truth that can never be done. But in the constructural realm of the diseased mind, in the mind-controlled brain, in the broken brain that is, that is physically damaged and has absolute destruction done to it and its logic circuits are not firing properly, in that mind, in that psyche, in that brain, the, in the constructural realm of disease, then, yes, we can claim a bunch of people coming together that do not have that right. We can multiply that by zero. They can give something that they don't have magically to others just because we claim it's for the greater good. You know, I can claim anything is for the greater good. Hitler claimed what he was doing was for the greater good. Stalin claimed what he was doing was for the greater good. Mao claimed what he was doing for the greater good. Uh, you know, Attila the Hun claimed what he was doing was for the greater good. Every tyrant throughout human history has always used the argument of the greater good. The bottom line is, it doesn't matter what someone claims is for the greater good. They have to be correct about whether the behavior is moral or not. And they cannot be given rights that don't exist, that are actually wrongdoings, and no one can delegate rights that don't exist, with, which are actually transgressions against natural law and wrongdoings. And we have to get out of this religious, cult, diseased mindset, which is what it is. It's mental illness is what it really is. I, I just want to say that at the intent, not at the risk, but at the intent of insulting people who still believe in the utterly insane cult called government, which is what it is. It's a religious nutter cult. That is what government has always been. It is a cult full of religious nutters that magically believe that they can give rights that do not exist to other people to do on their behalf. And that is the definition of a cult because a cult by definition, and I'm not saying occult, O-C-C-U-L-T, it is that as well, but put that aside for a moment. It is a cult, C-U-L-T. It is a dangerous religion, a religion full of false beliefs that has become a dangerous threat to others because people erroneously and fanatically have tied themselves to the erroneous beliefs of that religion. That is what turns a religion, which is generally, if it re remains in the realm of simple constructural uh, erroneous beliefs, remains in the realm of religion. But what turns a religion into a cult is those beliefs turn into violent actions that begin to create danger and harm for other people. And as we all know the greatest source of non-natural death over the last three centuries has been the cult called government. It's called democide. And if you look it up, that is the number one cause of non-natural death in the modern age is death by government. And I'm talking about one's own government, not just the government of some other uh, nation or geographical region of the world. Democide is the number one cause of non-natural death in the human species. Just thinking about that, uh, that's all we would really have need to know to understand the intent and the danger and the violence that this cult brings every, everywhere that it exists, which is every place in the entire world. I want to look at a, another quote here. This is from an economist, Murray N. Rothbard. He said, mm -hmm. if men were like ants, there would be no interest in human freedom. If individual men like ants were uniform, interchangeable, devoid of specific personality traits of their own, then who would care if they were free or not? Who indeed would care if they live or died? The glory of the human race is the uniqueness of each individual. The fact that e every person through 
though similar in many ways to others, possesses a completely individu individuated personality of his own. It is the fact of each person's uniqueness, the fact that no two people can be wholly interchangeable, that makes each and every person irreplaceable, and that makes us care whether he lives or dies, whether he is happy or oppressed. And finally, it is the fact that these unique personalities need freedom for their full development that constitutes one of the major arguments for a free society. So when you hear people say, um, I don't care about freedom, I just care about wealth maximization, I just care about having a high trust society, I care about getting high social status for myself, I just care about wealth, I just care about order. Why does freedom matter? Well, first of all, let me say uh, Rothbard is excellent. Uh, that's fantastic philosophy. Uh, I, I noticed uh, his book was entitled uh, uh, Egalitarian egalitarianism as a revolt against nature and that is trying to make everyone the same like ants in an ant colony and that is what they are trying to do they're not trying to uh, allow us our natural egalitarianism or equality under natural law see we're not equal or egalitarian in our abilities in our characteristics as a being of course everyone is different and should be different and that's what makes uh, the world go round as, as as the phrase says our, our differences but <clears throat> when it comes to our rights in nature our natural rights then we must all be equal. Everyone has exactly the same identical rights. Rights do not change for any individual. We all are imbued and are uh, birthrighted. We are endowed by the creator of the universe with uh, the natural rights that we have. So those don't change. Um, <clears throat> but uh, what Mar we're off bar is saying there that if you take away someone's self-determination, if you take away their freedom, they can't grow as an individual. You are constraining human potential when you place limitations like government, like uh, coercion and duress, etc. on it. The more violence that you inter interject in human society, which is what government always does, the more you are placing limitation on the abilities of the individual to act within their rights. So you can't have freedom of expression. You can't have freedom of self-determination of what you want to do with your life if government is basically continuously coercing you. You know, And um, ultimately, this boils down to what I call the law of freedom. And the people who want to say that they don't care about the freedom of others, they only care about their own well-being, we'll get to what that really is in a moment. Understanding how freedom is important is we, we have to understand how natural law works. There is a set of laws embedded in nature that one only really deeply begins to even see, let alone understand them, when one begins to study the occult world. These are laws that you're not going to find in a physics textbook. They're not going to be written in the section called Newtonian dynamics that govern physical behavior of objects and, and things. You're, you, they're not going to be found there. These are laws that are going to be found in high level esoteric philosophical texts that some of the most learned individuals who have ever lived wrote, and some of the wisest people who are alive today study. And many of the people in the so-called freedom movement, or you know, even in libertarian circles, even in conservative circles, they have zero idea about how the real laws of nature actually work in the physical domain. There are laws that govern human behavior. They don't just govern physical interaction between objects through physical dynamics and physics, okay? They govern what happens as a result of what we all do collectively. Now, what we do collectively comes about and is manifested in society as a whole based upon what we do as individuals. So the individual choice, the individual knowledge and information that one carries is informing individual behavior. Then individual behavior is going out into the world and interacting with society. As an aggregate, all those individual behaviors form the collective behavior or aggregate behavioral quality of all of, all of human society. And then 
the natural realm is going to provide consequences for that. There are always consequences. This is what is meant even in the Newtonian uh, axiom and dictum of every action has an equal and opposite reaction. What this means in the behavioral realm, now that is going to apply in the realm of forces in the physical realm, obviously, in the Newtonian sense. But in the philosophical and behavioral sense, and in the realm of esotericism, uh, esotericists have known this throughout the ages, in the realm of natural law, there is a interplay between behavior and consequence. And that is always there. It is a reaction that always takes place. We have information that we base our decisions on. Our decision-making ability goes to work, processes that information, comes to a decision about how we are going to behave. We enact the behavior in the world and consequences result. That happens in the aggregate sense. And then consequences result over long swaths of time for all of society as a whole. This is how real karma works. I refer to this as natural law. Many other esoteric philosophers throughout human history have called it the same in uh, Christian and other religious um, uh, ideologies. It has been called lex naturalis or the laws of nature. Natural law is what I tend to refer to it as, but you could also see this as cosmic law. You could see it as cosmic justice. You could see it as karma. You could see it as moral law. Whatever wording or label you want to put on it is ultimately long-term irrelevant because you could put any label you want on electromagnetism, but if you stick a fork that you just licked in the wall and hold on to the other end, uh, you know, you're going to have a problem, you know, if you put that in the electrical outlet, you know. So there are forces that are simply at work, no matter what name you put on them, whether you understand how they work or not is actually irrelevant. Whether you align your behavior to them or not is going to determine what happens. So you could decide I'm not going to align my behavior to gravity today. I'm going to climb up to the roof of my house and I'm going to do a triple backflip off the roof and right down to the concrete on the on the street, you're going to have problems if you ignore gravity like that. There are consequences for ignoring rules of nature. Laws of nature have consequences if they are broken, just like physical laws have consequences when they are broken. The non-physical laws that operate in the behavioral realm also have consequences when they are broken. And this is called what I refer to as the law of freedom. The law of freedom is as aggregate morality increases, aggregate freedom increases, meaning as we stop doing behaviors as a society that conduct and initiate physical harm against others, initiate harm against other sentient beings, and we stop condoning those behaviors, we stop saying that's okay, that's morally legitimate, I agree with that person conducting that violence, we have to stop doing that as well then more and more freedom will be manifested into our society in the aggregate sense as a whole. And as aggregate morality decreases and we become a society that does more violence, that does more immoral behavior, that condones more immoral behavior by agreeing with government and even believing government should exist, the society will invariably and inexorably, according to laws that exist naturally in the universe, be forced into a state of slavery, be forced to have their freedom destroyed. It is an absolute unwavering law in nature that works 100% of the time, invariably the same way at all times and places in the manifest universe. That is why it is a law. It's universal. It's non-man-made. It exists everywhere. It exists for all time. Nothing anybody does can change it. It's completely immutable. So when we act as moral people, we become free and remain free. When as a society, we act in an immoral capacity and we condone, conduct and condone more and more immoral behaviors, as a society, as a whole, as an aggregate, as a species, we become more and more enslaved. And until those behaviors change, 
will stay enslaved. That is how the laws of nature, that is how natural law actually functions to give us the consequences of the behaviorals of the behavioral choices that we have enacted in the world. So all of life really could be boiled down to it is a test of behavioral free will decision making and then consequence. So it's choice and consequence. And that's all there can ever be. We still retain free will to choose the behaviors that we will conduct, but we do not have the ability to escape the consequences that will come about as a result of the behaviors that we put out into the world. In that sense, the universe actually acts as a judgment mechanism. It acts as a huge mirror of cosmic justice. What we have done, what we have condoned, what we have allowed, we get back more and more and more, and it keeps coming down on us in future generations in the form of deeper and deeper bondage. It comes down in the form of slavery, of not being able to make your own choices, not being able to keep the product of your own labor, and ultimately not having even bodily autonomy. Those are the very definitions of what slavery is. The lack of free will choice, the lack of the ability to keep what you've earned, and not even having, not even being able to say that your body is actually your own. Someone else is forcing decisions upon your body. Uh, nothing could possibly even be more evil. It's worse than death. It's worse than dying. As the phrase often is said, there are things that are worth, worse than death. Slavery is one of them. And that is unfortunately where we're at. And it's what we have allowed the human condition to become as a, resu as a result of believing in the immoral, incorrect, completely erroneous cult belief system, which is a cult religion called government. And unfortunately, it's the biggest cult in the world, maybe the second biggest cult in the world, next to the cult of uh, believing in the um, uh, inherent value of money. But, you know, that that's another discussion because you can't you can't eat currency. You know, you can't eat it. You can't clothe yourself with it. It's also a constructural idea. It doesn't exist in nature. The real things that are valuable. First of all, our principles, which r exist in nature, uh, understanding truth, okay, living according to morality. And then once we get outside uh, those values, then the secondary value systems are what you can uh, breathable air, potable water, uh, food that is good and can be eaten uh, to nourish you. And then clothing to protect yourself from the elements, shelter to protect yourself from the elements, and the ability to uh, defend those things if they are attempted to be violently stolen from you in the form of arms and ammunition. Those are the things that have real inherent value. The mo monetary system as a mechanism of exchange, no matter what you use for the exchange, whether it is fiat or, or uh, precious metals or crypto, it, it, it is irrelevant because those are still constructural ideas that have to be agreed upon. Otherwise, they are essentially uh, non-valuable. Most people in a survival situation are not going to be worried about uh, silver coins if it's an, an actual natural disaster. You know, they're going to be concerned about, can I uh, you know, uh, stay alive. First of all, uh, can I, do I have water to drink? Do I have food to eat? Do I have, uh, you know, shelter to protect myself from the elements? That's what's going to be of inherent value. But, um, people have to understand that these natural laws, uh, of karma of, um, cosmic morality are always in effect. They are never out of effect for one moment, for one millisecond in time. Therefore, all of our behaviors are constantly informing that field of energy. They're constantly informing that big behavioral machine that is saying, it's not looking at why we did the things we did. It doesn't take a clipboard out and go, you know, he was really stressed that week. So he decided to go into the police force, get the paycheck because he you know, didn't have a lot of money and he's really stressed over not being able to pay his bills. So he's going to go in there and he's going to bust whatever heads they tell him to bust at the protest. You know, he's going to go and steal at the behest of the IRS resources that aren't his, don't belong to him. He has no right to take, you know, the, the, the cosmos is not sitting there with a clipboard going, why did you do it? All the cosmos cares about is you did it. This is what happened. 
See, that it's like a computer in that regard. It's not a personal force. It's not a personal entity. It's just niching up. It's putting on the board, racking up the points, zero or one, zero or one. Zero means you didn't do it. No harm, no foul. Give them some more freedom. One means you did do the harmful behavior, and now we have to curtail freedom in the whole aggregate sense in all of society. That's how it really works, whether anybody accepts it, believes in it or not. And I have come to the correct answer and conclusion about how it works. And I've actually done this through scientific experimentation, where I've done observable, repeatable, demonstrable results through a, an experiment in life where I would take certain behaviors, record the results, do different behaviors, record those results, and witness over a long period of time how quality of life changes just for the individual. And that's powerful. That shows you that this absolutely works and is real. Imagine if we did a long-term study with all of society as the guinea pig over a long period of time and track the entire evolutionary course of humanity based on the moral decision decision making that it is conducting or the immoral decision making that is conducting then we would see we would we would hammer down the the missing dynamic which is the ability to see clearly over long periods of time maintaining that long view of human history is unfortunately what most people don't have that they they don't have a wide enough view of that because quite simply at the risk of simply outright offending people they actually have just not taken in enough information to do it they don't have enough big picture heuristic systems analysis level of the world situation Okay, now let me repeat that. They don't have enough big picture, long view of history, heuristic and systems analysis level view. So systems um, analysis do things like collect enormous amounts of data over every single variable of the system that they are studying. They're not myopic thinkers that put their head way down and they go, let me examine this tiny little dynamic over here for the rest of my life. And I'm never going to take my attention off that little speck. Be and they never look at how the little speck interoperates, invariably interoperates and inextricably is interoperating with the whole, the system as a whole. Okay. And looking at systems level dynamics, they look at individuated dynamics. That's why specialists are often myopic and cannot see the big picture. And you see, I see this very often in the freedom movement. People want to focus in on one thing. They want to focus in on just the financial operations that the, the, the elite bankers are doing. And they want to become an expert in that, or they're going to become an expert in defeating the tax code, or they're going to become an expert in going into court and presenting arguments. But they're not systems level thinkers. That's why they've chosen to do something that can only ever make a tiny little speck of difference in a very limited localized space. We need big picture heuristic systems thinkers to realize how things work cosmically, what we are doing as a species, but not just in the individuated present moment. We need people who understand how these dynamics work over long, long periods of human history, over long periods of time. That's the main thing people get wrong when it comes to understanding how karmic laws really work in nature. They believe in this ridiculous, nonsensical, non-logical, non-proven uh, aspect of instant karma. You do something bad, boom, instantaneously, something's going to be taken away from you. It doesn't work like that. This is the realm of Hollywood. This is the realm of children's cartoons. This is the realm of low-level spirituality that is way off base and doesn't have the answer correct. 
And then they give this to people through these religious notions of what karma is. And then people latch onto it and believe it works like that. And then when, the, when this ridiculous notion of karma is then given to other people who have a little bit of logic in their mind and can think about it logically for a few moments, then they say, you know, that doesn't sound right because I really don't observe it working like that in the world. That must all be bunk. And then they throw the baby out with the bathwater and they throw the entire idea of karma out, which actually does <clears throat> have a way that it works in the natural realm. They just toss that out and say, well, m there must be no dynamics that govern behavior then. There's no natural law that governs human behavior. And then they go off in complete folly, not understanding how that dynamic really works, and then their behavior goes off base, and then they contribute to the chaos societally. If we understand how natural law really functions, we're going to understand how our behaviors as individuals fit into the overarching world dynamic, and then we're going to be able to teach that to other people so that they can see the bigger dynamic at work over long periods of time, and then adjust their behavior accordingly. Only when we do that are we going to make any progress toward real human freedom. And I've been trying to say this to this entire community for the past 15 years. They, quite frankly, only a very limited amount of them have ever even uh, taken it under advisement, let alone deeply studied it and understood it. And I hope that starts to change because with things like COVID, you know, uh, with that uh, utter nonsense garbage that uh, they brought down as a psyop upon us, and basically took over all of human society and shut things down, shut our prosperity down, shut our freedom down, uh, totally dictating uh, to us, taking bodily autonomy, autonomy away from people, forcing uh, people through coercion, not direct physical uh, violence, but through absolute coercion to put something into their body against their will. You think that was bad. That's going to be nothing, nothing compared to what's coming karmically and cosmically because as i've said many many times we are in the period of what i call cosmic judgment as a species this is what is happening it's not it's not the god of the bible it's not the god of the synagogue it's not the god of you know uh whatever mosque or temple anybody attends it's not that god okay i don't believe in those nonsensical religious gods you could take all of that and flush all that down the toilet as far as i'm concerned you know religion is a, is a cancer religion is a plague okay and the biggest religion that is the plague is the religion called authority that's the biggest plague you, you talk about any deaths that uh christianity catholicism judaism hinduism islam you could talk about the deaths that they've been responsible for over the ages and it pales in comparison to the plague called government the plague religion cult called government okay uh you know that is the the most dangerous cult that has ever existed in all of human society we have to get rid of that religious cult belief system and align our behavior to nat true natural law, understand what real morality is, take in that knowledge. That's what constitutes conscience. Conscience is the knowledge of objective morality. And then uh, putting our conscience into action is exercising our conscience. That is willfully choosing what we know to be right over what we know to be wrong and willfully not condoning and speaking out against evil, speaking out against violence, speaking out against coercion and doing, doing that to educate others. And if we do that, then we could reverse this process of cosmic judge judgment. This comes from the true creator of the universe. This comes from the, the force of intelligent creation that underlies every law that exists that set every law in the motion. You could call it whatever you want. If you want to call it God, go ahead. If you want to call it the creator, go ahead. If you want to call it a force, go the force, go ahead. You know, take it out of Star Wars, call it the force. It doesn't make a difference what you call it. It's the thing that put all the matter and laws of both matter and behavior into effect in the universe. And the last time I checked, I don't, I don't know, I could be wrong, but the last time I checked, that wasn't me, that wasn't you, that wasn't everybody put together on earth, that wasn't humanity. Humanity didn't do that. We didn't snap our fingers or think a thought and the universe came into existence and all the laws that govern the universe came into existence and just operate according to a certain set of strict 
parameters that never change, right? And then that has to have intelligent design by definition. And that's not any of the beings in the physical domain. That is something that exists as something that is completely non-personal, based in pure law, and it is a, uh, it's ineffable. It's not something you're ever going to fully know or, or describe in the physical domain. Yet, that higher force certainly exists, and our behaviors are bound by it. We cannot just do whatever we want as long as we don't get caught. The proof is in the pudding, as they say. All you have to do to determine that natural law exists and is in operation is look at the result. So how do you perform any other science? How do you perform any scientific observation or um, analysis of scientific phenomena? All you do is look first. You have to make observations. Upon the observations, then you you hypothesize. You put forth a hypothesis to explain the observations. So you're observing, you're keeping track of your observations, you hypothesize regarding them, and then you create a theory based on what you believe is happening. Then you do testing to either verify or have to refine the theory. If it's verified, you publish your results. If it uh, isn't verified, you refine your hypotheses and do the procedure over again, then you publish your results. That's called the scientific method. The exact process of the scientific method can and should be conducted when it comes to natural law. And if a serious scientific investigation is done according to those parameters regarding natural law, it will be confirmed that this does exist. It's not conjecture or speculation. I'm not telling you what my opinion is. I don't have a religion. This isn't a belief. I don't believe in natural law. I definitively know that it is in operation and exists and binds my life. That's the problem with other people in this movement. They do not know that definitively. They have not studied that scientifically to such an extent. They need to study it to a, an obsessive extent to prove to themselves beyond the shadow of a doubt, beyond any reasonable doubt that it absolutely exists and is in operation in this world. And then when they know that, their whole worldview will shift into stop thinking about the tiny little speck over here in the corner and look at it from a big systems heuristic systems analysis perspective. And you can only do that once you have the knowledge of natural law in hand. It's not possible any other way. One of the major hurdles to understanding natural law, understanding your rights and your freedoms, because uh, once they're violated and the entire corporate press is defending them, it's a little hard. Uh, well, you've already been uh, so, so insecure by saying, I don't have rights, only the state does, and they delegate them. Once all these experts are on TV, it's like, well, it's unlikely that all of them are wrong. So it's a little difficult to see through. So I'm going to go through three examples of how the media is, I'm going to use the word always, bias, because, well, anytime you choose to report on one thing and not another, uh, you are engaged in bias. So my first crime against the press here, I call cherry picking. This is reporting from Newsweek, major organization. They wanted to do a story about Alex Jones. Infowars' Alex Jones appeared to be viewing transgender pornography while filming personal wellness segment. So the cherry picking there is Alex Jones has snuck into the Bohemian Grove, exposing one of the most important things ever. But when they report on him, this is what they go to. Now, is this a lie? Well, uh, whatever. The point is, even if it is true, what they're doing is they are creating a narrative about how this person is by selecting some things and not others. Second thing is inflation. Uh, well, uh, I call this the laziness um, approach that the media always has. What's causing inflation? Economists point fingers at different culprits. Yet it's certainly not the Federal Reserve monopolizing the currency and then expanding it by $7 trillion uh, within uh, the last four years. It can't be that. I would never devalue <laughs> the purchasing power of the dollar. Well, Keith, come on. Well, the, the, the good thing, the, the good thing is the dollar can't be devalued because it has inherent value, if you remember correctly. Uh, and then finally, <laughs> and then finally, sensationalism. Every day is January 6th now, says the New York Times. So January 6th was really a date and there was really a protest. But 
the mind control comes in when they constantly sensationalize and report on January 6th literally every day as though uh, politicians being uncomfortable for the first time in my lifetime is something bad. But uh, certainly Yemen, uh, can we talk about that mass murder campaign? How about the mass murder in Afghanistan of civilians or Iraq? God or, killing, or, or, or killing 900,000 Japanese civilians in 1944 uh, to 1945 or the Holodomor. <laughs> See that none of this takes precedent. It's all about January 6th. So cherry picking, laziness and sensationalism, all corporate press follows falls into those three categories and that's what michael humor means when he says that the press is bullshit so to speak and the enemy of the people the, there are active <laughs> exactly. enemy in engaged in psychological warfare what i'd like to say to your viewing audience regarding the mainstream media is do not fall into the mistake of believing that this is simply um incompetence and or a uh, simple bias. And what I mean by that is that you have to understand something much larger is going on in the background behind the mainstream media. And I would hope that uh, your listening audience uh, would have a, a beginning of the understanding of this. Uh, but it is a completely controlled entity. It is run by people who are the enemies of the people. Now, that is one intelligence agencies. And um, there were congressional representatives doing uh, studies of uh, who were the owners of media organizations and, um, you know, uh, how many people who were actively on uh, the payroll of certain intelligence agencies uh, in past decades were now on the payroll of news agencies and, uh, you know, corporate press. And uh, back in the early 80s, it was determined that just about every single uh, mainstream media institution of any significance already had people within the CIA on its payroll operating from the inside to manipulate and control the news that the so-called journalists of those organizations put out to the public to control the, the narrative that the public gets to even experience and think about. But I'm going to go even further than that. It is not just a corrupt institution. It is not just a biased institution. It is not just an infiltrated institution in being infiltrated by agents of the intelligence agencies. The mainstream media is wholly owned and run by dark occultists. It is an occult organization. Now, I didn't say cult here. C-U-L-T. It is an occult organization, O-C-C-U-L-T, meaning hidden from sight, meaning you don't get to see who really runs the show. The, the owners and managers are just out there to act as the front men who make the decisions to control the organization, who's really calling the shots behind the scenes are dark occultist social engineers. The world, all the world world's institutions, all the worldly bodies of all the institutions on this planet are controlled by dark occultists. And this is covert religion. That's what we're talking about here. Now, many different beliefs can be characteristics and hallmarks and define dark occultism, but the essential inner core ideology is Satanism. And Satanism, once again, isn't what we hear about in the media isn't what we hear about in Hollywood, isn't what is depicted in Hollywood, okay? It's not what even religions tell us that it is. It is a worldview and an ideological way of being in the world that is dictated by pure egotism over everything else. It's me, 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 me. I have to come first. I have to get what I want. Screw everybody else and their rights. If I profit, that's all that matters. If I have to do something wrong and step on other people and their rights to get what I want, so be it, okay? Then number two, it's total moral relativism. There's no such thing as an objective standard of right and wrong behavior. It's just whatever I want to believe it is. It's what makes me feel good or it's what gets me what I want. 
There's no objective right and wrong. I could get to arbitrate it and make it up, or the people organization that I work with and for can just arbitrate that and make it up. That's number two of what Satanism is. Now, if you just think about the first two right there, are most people in society in pure egotistical mindset? Are most people in society doing their behaviors in total lack of care? They could care less whether the behavior is moral. The majority of people on this planet will perform an immoral behavior for enough money, for enough resources, for enough wealth, for enough comfort. And that's sad. And the problem is most people won't say, even say that. They won't even say that, let alone know it deeply. You know, they won't even say the majority of people are immoral people. We're in this. We couldn't possibly be in the situation that we are in as a society, in the state of slavery that we are in, in the state of duress that we are in, in the state of violence that we are always held under threat to. If we were not in the aggregate immoral people. Good people don't have those consequences come down upon them like that because good people didn't do those behaviors, didn't condone those behaviors, and would have stopped those behaviors once they started. When when people don't when people continue to do those behaviors for enough money, those immoral behaviors we talked about, when they continue to condone those behaviors because that's more comfortable than speaking out against them. And when people continue to allow those behaviors to be conducted in their midst in all of society, what do you think is going to be the behavioral result or the manifestation or the consequence? It is going to be the destruction of freedom and it's going to be human slavery. The occultists know this. They know that most people are like this. They are continuously manipulating people through the media and the press. These are the social engineers that sit entrenched, that that no matter who be becomes the new uh, face of the organization, the new CEO, CFO, COO, it doesn't make a difference. You could put whatever letters you want behind their name. They come and go. The ruling body still remains this covert religious cult that is operating according to the ideology of Satanism, pure egotism, moral relativism. Social Darwinism is their third tenet. They believe that all of society should have a pecking order like vicious animals, like low-level consciousness animals in the animal kingdom and in the wild have. Well, we're not low-level, low vicious, instinct-only animals. We are human beings that are higher, a higher form of life than animals that have been given the, the gift of the complexity, the complexity of the human brain and hu human nervous system that has the characteristics within our psyche and mind that make it possible for us to have deep intellectual thought, to have deep philosophical thought, to, to think about and determine how morality operates. And then to choose our behaviors willfully, not out of pure instinct. That makes us more than the average animal in the animal kingdom. That's why we separate humans in the animal kingdom from other animals. Okay? So <clears throat> the, the, the bottom line when it comes to this is, is that this community has to realize that this covert religion is in operation. They repeatedly fail to do so. And it's highly, highly disappointing. It's highly disappointing that they maintain this very, very rigid refusal to look at the operation of covert religion or occult religion at work in the world. This is religious. These are religious beliefs. No one's going to come forward and acknowledge this is my belief system because of what it contains. They're going to say, oh, I'm Christian. Oh, I'm Jewish. Oh, I'm Hindu. They're not going to come out and say they're Satanists. Satanism is pure egotism. To acknowledge that, you're, you're basically agreeing right out front. I don't really give a damn about you. Who's going to vote for you or want you in their organization? You know, but that's their overarching first tenet. Who's going to want to go out and say, who's going to want to go and work with somebody or, or, um, vote for somebody, let's say, that's, that says, there's no right and wrong. Huh. If we can get away with it. We could do whatever the hell we want. I don't believe in the concept of right and wrong. 
Is that going to go over really well with people? Even though most people are moral relativists even and, and will probably philosophically agree. And that's why they keep condoning their immoral behaviors. If they say, you know what? Society should be run like a pack of wolves and the most vicious wolves with the worst snarl and the sharpest teeth that can rip the others apart should just come to the top of the roost through violence, right? And I'm perfectly fine with that. Who's going to vote for that politician if they come out and admit that that's their religion? So they don't put it out in the open. It re re remains covert, hidden, or occulted. That's what the occult is. And then the fifth, uh, the fourth, I'm sorry, and final tenet is eugenics, the final solution, right? If you're the king of the world because, hey, your, your good genetics got you there through eugenics, and you're the most vicious snarling wolf with the sharpest teeth and claws that can rip the others apart with their violence or get other people to do their violence for them because they're mind controlled by their cult beliefs, that the order followers, the military and the police, that the snarling attack dogs, you know, that the higher level social engineers send to do their bidding because ultimately they're really cowards and they're not the strongest animals. They're just the most deceptive. They're the ones that are wisest about how human, they have the most information and knowledge about how human, the human psyche can be manipulated. So they're the, they're the chief manipula manipulators of all society. That's who the occultists are. And they get order followers to do their bidding for them. And then the order followers taking on the cosmic karmic debt of performing those behaviors because they're the ones actually doing them with their bodies. The, 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 the order, order, follow, order givers are just speaking to them and telling them to go do it. And then the order follower goes and performs the behavior. So their karmic uh, consequence is even greater, their, their um, moral culpability and cosmic consequence. So um, we have to understand, and, and the, the, the people who are only thinking about this from the political and the financial aspects, and even the ma mainstream mass media aspects, have to understand this is all coming from the dictates of occult social engineers. That are, they, they operate in the shadows. They don't come out and put their name out into the public. They don't come out and announce their religious beliefs. Because ultimately, they want to cull the herd. That's what eugenics is. Eugenics is physical culling of a population by selective breeding, by trying to generate the characteristics that the engineer of that society and the genetics of that society want to see out there, and then culling away the characteristics that they don't want in society. And we have to stop even thinking of that belief system of theirs as eugenics because it's not doing anything good. The Greek prefix EU means good. OK, you know, we have to start thinking about what they're calling eugenics, laughingly calling eugenics as dysgenics, because that's what it really is in physical operation in the world. It's a system of dysgenics to breed out the good characteristics that humanity could be developing to evolve itself and to come out of this state of slavery. But the social engineers don't want that. So they're breeding selectively the characteristics that are actually dysgenic characteristics that are going to make people stay in slavery. That is who these people are. That is what they do. They're in control of the organizations. They own the military. They own the police. They own the um, uh, government institutions. They own the banking institutions. Um, they own the, the, the media. They own the hospitals and uh, medical institutions. They own everything. They're entrenched. Them and their corrupt ways and their corrupt ideologies and their covert religion is entrenched in every single operational aspect of human society, bar none, including traditional religion. All of it. Not some of it. All of it. And people will not accept that for a couple of reasons. Here's the two main reasons that people won't accept it. The first is very simple. They have no gnosis of the thing. It's not just knowledge by hearing about it, reading about it, maybe seeing little bits and evidence of it. 99.9999% of 
every single human being that has ever lived has no direct experiential knowledge of these covert religions at work because they've never become a member of them. It's a very small elitist class of society. People are either born into it through their bloodline, through their family, or they are recruited and groomed into it because the the, the small nature the, the the nature of the these social engineers as being a very tiny tiny percentage of humanity makes it necessary it necessitates that they must go out and recruit people who are not bloodline members to do their dirty work to actually do their behaviors and basically get the things done that they want done they don't have the manpower just in the small group of actual ultra elite uh, the con true control class that exists as far as numbers are concerned. So that is the aspect that I was involved in. And they do this by recruiting people that they think are either of very high IQ or very high skill set level that still are not developed spiritually enough to have understood the laws of karma, to have understood the laws of morality and behavior and have an actively developed conscience through that knowledge. They want people who are borderline psychopathic, who are totally egotistical, who are satanic in that regard. They've taken on the satanic mindset that these social engineers have actually given to all of society. And they're recruiting people like that of low moral intelligence, but of high intellect and high skill set. That's one of the reasons that I was brought up into these organizations is because I have an extremely high IQ. I consider myself a systems level thinker or a systems analysis. I can see very big picture heuristic thinking over long periods of time and extrapolate over periods of time as to the result or consequence. I'm very highly accurate when it comes to that. And it's one of the reasons that they wanted me in the cult. And I did end up in the occult world and in their cult for many years until I saw what they're trying to ultimately implement long term is human slavery. And I didn't sign up for that. I was one of these people that you're talking about, Keith. I was one of the people who just said, I just want more for me. All I care about is my money. All I care about is my societal influence. All I care about is my earthly power while I'm alive. All I care about is what I get from me and my own. That's all I gave a damn about when I was younger. I was in that satanic mindset of me, 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 selfishness. As long as I get mine, I don't care about other people. But when it came to finding out things that they were speaking about quite openly in their rituals and in their private meetings, they were out to enslave others so that only they would have freedom and be able to do whatever they want, no matter how immoral, to the point of taking other people's rights, doing brutal violence to other people and keeping them under their thumb and keeping them under duress and making them act and conform to their will. Or, or they would send people to do violence unto them. And um, doing even more horrific, unthinkable things, crimes with children, sex crimes with children, et cetera, so forth. It's all part of that world. It's all in the underbelly of politics and banking and mass media, et cetera. And we're hearing more and more about it in, uh, uh, you know, little leaks that come out and, uh, and alert us as to what's going on. People saying they've been invited to sex orgies. Uh, they've seen uh, the abuse of children, you know, et cetera. And, and so forth and seeing weird, crazy rituals that are clearly not of any uh, religion that is known to the average person because these people aren't operating on that level. They're operating at the level, as I said, of covert religion. If you're uncomfortable calling it Satanism, which is what it is. It's not Satanism isn't what Hollywood tells you. It's not what your preacher told you. It's those tenets that I told you about rampant selfishness to the point of you don't care about whether you perform immoral behaviors. All you care about is what you get as a benefit. And most of society is that most of society will take a job and take payment if it means doing something immoral as long as they get theirs. I'd say 95% of humanity or better is like that. Moral relativism. Again, no such thing as right and wrong. They're constructural ideas. We get to make it up. There's no objective standard of what a right is. 
A right isn't an action that does not initiate harm to others. No, it's just something I get to make up. If I feel good and I want to slap somebody in the face for no reason today just because I'm in a sour mood, well, then that's my right. It was good for me. It made me feel better. You know, you know that, that's what a moral relativist says. The real definition of a right is it's an action that does not initiate harm to other sentient beings. And most people, even in the freedom movement, can't give you the definition of a right. They still don't understand what that is, and that's why they're losing it. That's why they're losing them. If you can't define something, you're surely going to lose it as a possession. You know, if you can't define the thing that starts your car as your car keys, or your car fob, you don't even know what it looks like, let alone can you define what it does. Uh, good luck finding it, using it, holding on to it, not losing it. OK, because it's going to be out of your mind in the next second. And that's where we're at as a society. We, we can't hold on to something because we don't even know what it is in reality. You know, so we have to get past this discomfort in realizing Covert religion has been at work in the world for countless centuries, for thousands of years, not hundreds, for thousands of years, for millennia. And these, this priest class, this occult ruling class priest class is who is really ultimately calling the shots behind what we refer to as the deep state. Forget the deep state is important to understand, but forget that as thinking that's the ones who are calling the shot. They're the operational arm. They're the arm of the king. They're the hand of the king. Look at it like that. But the king is the occult priest class that sits behind the throne and whispers in their ear. You know, they put them out on the physical iron throne to make you believe they're the king. Right. They, they want you to believe the military industrial complex, the bankers, the pharmaceutical cartels, etc., that they're the rulers of the world. They're not the rulers of the world. They're the order takers who are taking the orders of the real social engineer class. They're taking the orders of, of those people. And that priest class is who really runs the world. The world is not st still to this day as powerful as government is as an enslaving influence. Government is the operational arm. The real rulers are still operating above it in the realm of religion. Religion has always run the world. Religion is still running the world. But it has gone from the realm of overt religion running the world through traditional cultural religions, which people stop believing in to a large extent, obviously not entirely. But it doesn't have the sway and the power and it doesn't hold people in thrall the way quite that it used to. And so people would rebel against that. So they've invented the new religion of the ages. And the new religion is called government based in authority, just like the king or the priest of the ancient world had total authority over his people and they were his subjects and his slaves. That's it. And now the new religion is we'll, div we'll divest that authority over an oligarchically small group of people. It'll be a few people and we'll say that they have the authority and we'll put them out in front of people as the authority figures. And that'll be called government. And it's just the same old religion. The, the old religion is the new religion. Right. And that's one of the things they call Satanism, the old religion. That's what it is referred to by people within their ranks at higher levels. When I was involved in Satanism in my youth, they didn't call it Satanism. No one there went, welcome to the monthly meeting of Satanists uh, throughout the region. That, that wasn't spoken. They didn't talk like that. OK. They just called themselves us. There was no name given. It's just us and everybody else. That's how they see the world. And people can't see their mindset. They can't see their religious beliefs. They want to insist that it doesn't exist because it's more comfortable to live in a world that isn't run by a psychopathic group of hidden priests. You know, do you think I want to say the world is run by an occult priest class of psychopaths be, uh, for my own good or health or something, you know, this isn't what I want to be doing. The people in the freedom movement have to start understanding things. The world doesn't work the way you think it works at all. Not even a tiny little bit. How you think the whole banking system works as much as you may know about it in the overt sense. 
behind the scenes, it doesn't work like that. People who you don't know the names of are calling the shots about how it really works. And you don't know their religion. And you don't know their mindset and their ideology. And you better start getting wise to it. You better start learning who, how, how those people think and what their religion is and the tenets that it contains and the ideologies it contains. Because they're making decisions about your life and your freedom. And it doesn't matter whether you believe in what they believe. This is the other nonsensical argument. You know, it's, I don't believe in that crap. That's all <laughs> nonsense. That's crazy. No kidding. It's crazy. Who said it was sane to think like that? Of course it's crazy. What do you think? Crazy people don't believe in crazy nonsense? It, invent it and turn it into a big religion and then more crazy people flock to it and it becomes a big cult? That's what happened. People don't even understand that's what happened in this on this planet. That's what happened on Earth. And people got to get used to the idea and get comfortable with the idea. Stop refusing to accept it. You don't do anything but hurt yourself. By not accepting the existence of the occult religion at work in the world, people who say they want freedom are doing a few things. Here's what they're doing. And I'm belaboring this because it's of such vital importance. Here is actually what the results they're putting out into the world are. One, they're hurting their own effort. That's number one what they're doing. They're not doing a service to freedom. They're harming it. Because they're not telling people, they're not learning the totality of the dynamic. And without learning the totality of the dynamic, you can never understand how the system operates. If you're going to get to systems level knowledge, systems level analysis, analysis which we talked about is of utmost importance. You have to understand all the variables of the system and be able to understand how they operate and to track their operation and to see how, how they work at work in the world. If you refuse through personal bias of fear and bias of what you want to believe, if you refuse to put those variables into the equation and you push them out of the picture, you have an equation that is completely incomplete with missing variables, missing chunks. Then when you try to solve that equation and understand the systems level heuristic and the systems level paradigm, okay, you are not going to get, arrive at the correct answer. You're not going to arrive at the correct conclusion and the correct understanding. You're going to have a flawed heuristic. You're going to have a flawed mechanism that you're working through. And then when you try to make sense of reality that way, it's not going to really accurate re accurately reflect reality. Then in your flaw, in your flawed axiom, in the way you analyzed it, then when you give it to other people informationally, you're not giving them the truth. You're giving them a flawed axiomatic picture. And then they start building from a flawed axiom. So the number one thing is it does harm in the world, ultimately, to not accept the reality of that situation because you're uncomfortable with it or fearful of it. It doesn't matter whether you agree with it or not. Other people believe in this sick, crazy stuff, and they're acting on it. Again, I give the analysis of uh, the analogy, I'm sorry, of d does a person sitting in a diner need to believe in absolutely off the wall religious nutter beliefs when bullets and gunfire rain in through the windows because there's an abortion clinic right next to the diner they're eating in and they're sitting in the window seat next to it and people with submachine guns come and shoot up the abortion clinic because of their religious beliefs now set aside what you think of abortion for a moment you know, w regardless of whether one believes that, you know, people have the right to do that or whether it's a wrongdoing, which I personally come down on the side that it's a form of violence and a wrongdoing. You don't go and fire up the abortion clinic with bullets, number one, because that's direct violence against these people. You could try make an effort to try to stop this from happening, but you're going to put other people in harm's way by simply doing that totally unrestrained and bullets are going to go through the window and hit the person eating in the diner. So 
would it be a valid argument for people to say, you know what, I don't believe in what those religious nutters who are going to go and shoot up the abortion clinic tomorrow believe in. So it doesn't exist. Think about the insanity of saying that, right? Yeah, you don't believe in it. No kidding. That doesn't mean that if they shoot up the abortion clinic while you're sitting next door in the diner that you might not get hit by the bullets. It's the same thing when it comes to covert religion called Satanism operating in the world. You don't need to believe in it. Other people do. They're acting on it and they have the reins of society. Therefore, it's going to affect you. So, so that's really number two. The third dynamic that has to be understood by these people is they will never get what they say they want as a result unless they understand the whole totality of the picture and start understanding what these people are ultimately long term trying to do is keep the knowledge of natural law to themselves so people never really learn how to behave and stop helping them conduct their agenda through immoral behavior. And as long as this general community called the freedom movement or whatever you want to call it refuses to accept the people who are really in highest level control and operation of this planet, as long as they refuse to accept that covert religion is really at the reins and at the helm of that operation, do not expect to get what you say you want, which is freedom. It's an impossibility to obtain freedom in a state of ignorance. Thomas Jefferson once said, freedom and ignorance existing simultaneously in a, in a state of civilization is what never has been and what never will be. You will never have those two things simultaneously in society, freedom and ignorance. They are diametric opposites that create the exact opposite dynamics in society behaviorally and consequentially as a manifested result of what we get through the behaviors we put out. Because if we're ignorant, we choose incorrectly and unwisely. And then we output wrong behavior into the world that creates the result we don't want. By not even having the knowledge of how our society and its control system is structured, this group of people in the freedom movement, by refusing to accept that and understand how that actual covert system operates and how it controls people's thinking, is not coming to the correct answers. Therefore, it can never truly enact the correct solutions. And therefore, they will repeatedly say, I want freedom, I want freedom, I want freedom, but can never achieve the state of freedom because they can never actually enact the dynamics that are the requirements for the state of freedom. They can't enact those situations into the world. Therefore, they're powerless. And this is what is meant by when you come without why, you come with no power. If you don't understand the dynamics that are the causal factors, that are the causal creative factors, the, the raison d'etre, the reason for being of the manifested results that we are getting, you are powerless to change those results, those manifestations, because you are operating in the realm of the, the world of effects instead of the realm of causes. And as you learn when you study real occult philosophy is in order to make any true change happen, you never analyze the result or the manifestation. That is what happened because of the causes. You study the realm of causes. You study the underlying causal factors that gave rise to that manifested result. Then when you understand how those dynamics work at the foundational causal level, you will understand why you are getting the result that you are getting. So by definition, do, does the freedom movement in the aggregate, does humanity, could they possibly understand the real causal dynamics that are happening? Well, all you have to do is ask yourself, has the state of human freedom erupted onto the earth and manifested in our lives? And we know the answer to that is no. Therefore, it is an abject impossibility that the majority of people in the freedom movement or in society as a whole have understand the causal dynamics. And they never will until they accept the existence 
an operation of covert religion or occultism operating in this world and on this planet. And just one final question for you. Sure. I want to uh, respect your time. How can a person determine whether they are conscious or under mind control, so to speak? So that's a great question. And I'll, I'll, I'll indirectly give you the answer. I'll attempt to provide a, a basic uh, answer to that. But if you want the real full answer to that question, first of all, I highly recommend viewing my natural law seminar, which talks about natural law, objective morality, the world of the occult, et cetera, and occult principles and the operations of natural law and the law of freedom, et cetera. It's about an eight and a half, almost nine hour presentation uh, that you can get that for free. Uh, that's my documentary right there that you're displaying on um, n natural law. I call it the science of natural law. But if you go to videos, um, that is the very first video on the videos page. It is called uh, well, the documentary is the first, and then underneath that, it'll load in a moment on Odyssey. Uh, natural law, the real law of attraction, and how to apply it in your life. It is put up there in three parts. So that's a three-part series totaling almost nine hours of lecture material with slides. So I highly recommend that three-part series, okay? Secondly, to answer your question about how does one determine whether or not they themselves are actually awake, I would highly recommend uh, if you scroll f a little bit further down, I'm not sure quite f how far you'd have to go. It's a, it's a series of presentations called Streetwise Spirituality. Streetwise Spirituality, I'm very proud of. It's one of the presentations, there it is, that I, that I gave that I really, really um, am very proud of the uh, basic philosophy that came out of this seminar, because that's exactly what it does. It talks about what does it really truly mean to be awake? Forget this nonsensical wokeism garbage that we're seeing in the world about, you know, you know, uh, opp these oppressed for further you know, segregated minorities in gender going all the way down to like such granular things that like, you know, it's, 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 it's absurd. You know, how about understanding the smallest minority as the individual? How about stop thinking in collectivist terms, start thinking in moral terms and on terms of moral principles. And then you understand that the smallest minority in the world that anyone needs to be concerned about is simply the individual and individual rights. Then we'll, then we'll be on to something. But in that streetwise spirituality presentation, I gave 20 dynamics, 20 characteristics of what it actually means to be an awake human being in the modern world. And, you know, I'm not going to get into every single one of them, but the main ones are understanding the existence and operation of occultism in the world. That's really number one, because if you don't do that, you're not going to get to an understanding of natural law, which is taught in realms of occultism. It's not religion. It's occult science. This is why the social engineers want to keep the workings of that occult science from people, because if you understand it, it leads to freedom. And if you don't understand it, it leads to slavery. What do you think the occult engineers want? freedom or slavery for everybody else. They want freedom for their, themselves and slavery for everybody else. So they want to understand those dynamics and they want everybody to remain ignorant of them so they can continue to manipulate and deceive them. It's actually very logical and easy to understand. Is you got to get the roadblocks of what you already think the way the world works out of your head. That's the problem that most people have. They're rooted in egotism and they're rooted in fundamental flawed axiomatic beliefs. They think they're smarter than they really are. And that's the problem. This community has not reached the level of intelligence that is required to come out of slavery, unfortunately. And that's not making a blanket statement. Some individuals have. It's not enough. The dynamic has to be pushed over the breaking point, over the tipping point. And we're nowhere near that because so many people are still in ignorance of the reality in which we live. Just one of the other main basic factors, I won't get into them all. If you want to study all 20, you can view that uh, presentation for free, of course. All of my material is free online. Uh, I only ever hold in my gift area the most recent presentation that I've ever given. I usually hold that in my gifts area 90 days, then I release it for free. So right now I have nothing on deck in the gifts area. 
Every piece of material I've ever done is free on this website. I do not charge for my material. If you want a hard copy, you can make a donation to receive a hard copy through gifts, but I do not uh, just charge to uh, receive the material in like a, through a paywall or a subscription. It's all free. Okay. So the, the next major um, characteristic is one has to understand objective reality, uh, objective morality uh, under natural law and align their behavior to it. And that involves stop believing in the, uh, in, in the moral legitimacy of government. There is no such thing as the moral legitimacy of government because it is just a continuation of the old world concept of authority, which was never moral. A king commanding subjects as his slaves saying, I'll take whatever percentage I want of what you earn and you must obey my commands no matter how coercive they may become is immoral. It's coercion and violence on its face. All authority is that. Authority and kingship are the same thing. Authority, government, and kingship are all the same thing. They're just different words and euphemisms for violence. They're just different euphemisms for slavery. Ultimately, it's all slavery. The king enslaved his subjects. It's not a beneficent ruling dignitary who wants the best for his subjects and would always respect their freedom and autonomy. No, the king dictates law. Law is out of the mouth of the king. This is where we get the word jurisdiction from, to speak the law. Juris, jus, juris in Latin, J-U-S, means, and the genitive would be J-U-R-I-S, or I-U-R-I-S, if, if we're looking at classical Latin, there's no J. Jus, juris in Latin means law, dictation, dicto, dictare in Latin means to speak or to say. Literally, jurisdiction is to say what the law is, to speak the law. Someone is bound by what you say the law is, what the king says the law is, what the authority says the law is, what the state says the law is. Imagine that. I'm going to say what the law is. No, I'm going to explain through the discovery of the law how the law is operates in the world. I'm not the one that says it and puts it out into existence. It doesn't exist because I spoke it. Okay. I'm simply explaining it like someone would explain how the law of gravity works or how the laws of electromagnetism work. That's it. You know, it's discoverable. The universe didn't place natural, the natural laws of morality here to torture us with their inability to ever be understood. We have to do the work to understand how they operate, then teach that to other people and make it common sense. When we do that, we'll get out of this insane state called slavery, the slavery of government. If we still keep believing in the moral legitimacy of authority and still keep believing that we can dictate to other people what the, the natural laws are, what their rights actually are, or and if we still want to condone the violence that, that is inherent to the state and inherent to authority and inherent to um, the, the covert religion that's running the world, then get used to slavery. It's going to be with humanity for a long, long, long time if that's the path that we choose. It's The good news is we have free will even though it may be very deeply ingrained, we can still make a choice in the moment to change the way we think and then ultimately long-term change our behavior and eventually change the manifested experience that humanity is undergoing. Thanks to everyone for watching Keith and I Don't Tread on Anyone and the Libertarian Institute. Check out what on earth is happening.com as well as the One Great Work Network. Mark Passio, thank you so much for your time, brother. Keith, thank you so much for inviting me. Great questions. Uh, great work that you're doing, my friend, on One Great Work Network and in all your other platforms. I have uh, uh, you know, will occasionally keep abreast of your work, and you're doing a phenomenal job, my friend. Keep it up. Keep putting the word out there. Keep educating people. Keep being a light in the darkness. And thank you so much uh, for the opportunity of coming onto the show. Now we're going to get to some enhanced video, and we'll go play by play through some of the more occultic statements, like we shall read the sign in your burned effigy, the bound body. That's exactly what the Druids actually did. They would roast cats, uh, goats, oxen, horses, and watch the pain of how they died, and 
from this extract some type of mystical energy force or power and also be able to tell the future. Our of Bohemia, we beseech the grant us thy counsel. Upon further research of the ritual you just witnessed, it becomes clear. It is a mixture of the Babylonian Canaanite cult of Moloch fused with ancient Druidic rites where you have the female side of Satan, which they first call out to in the she, and then towards the horn god with the he, mixed with Masonic rites from Scotland. It's very likely that many of the 1,500 to 2,000 member crowd had really no idea what they were actually watching because it was thinly veiled. Here we have some more enhanced video as the boatman, again with his face painted up like a skull, pulls his boat uh, across the small lake towards the high priest with the red of his cloak visible with his hand outstretched as if he is pulling the damned soul towards him as they throw off their cares, their conscience for what they have to do in the world. Also, you have the arrangement of the circle of higher level priests around him, the high priest in lighter colors, and then the outer rooms of red, and then those in black. Uh, this is consistent uh, with the darker workings of the occult, not just with the Western uh, countries, but also worldwide. Now, when you see that black edge coming to the field, that's because we zoomed in on the video, and many times the picture was almost out of the screen, so that's the edge of the field or the view of the camera. We'll get back to more enhanced video of the ritual here in just a minute. But remember PJ, the little demon down in the corner, the left-hand corner of the program, sweeping up the ashes with little horns? And how can you forget this, the image of a human body burning on the altar? Again, this is what they were handing out to those that were witnessing uh, these macabre activities. But again, from Babylon on into ancient England, the word bone fire, meaning human sacrifices being thrown into fiery pits, turned into today's bond fire. After the sacrifice, members of the cult would sweep up the ashes of the victim and use them in future rituals. One of the things that is extremely obvious by looking at the program handed out to Bohemian Club members is the person creating the program had a deep understanding of the occult. Please, 
which hither ye have brought from regions where I reign. Ye fools and priests, I spit upon your fire. Wow. Prince of all mortal wisdom, Owl of Bohemia, we beseech thee, grant us thy counsel. Owl of Bohemia, we thank thee for thy adjuration. There you see the funeral pyre burning uh, with the effigy of a human, or it could be real, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, there's been a lot of strange going-ons in that area of Northern California, but this is what the establishment is into uh, right here in America, the cremation of care. And this was July 15th, 2000. These people are deadly serious, those taking part in the ceremony. Another point, the pyrotechnics you're seeing going off uh, were being released from beneath little rod iron crosses about a foot and a half tall. Also, notice the screams of pain coming uh, from the sacrifice. Sets us free. Yeah. 